essentially in order to break an addictive pattern, to become unaddicted, 30 days of zero interaction with that substance, that person, et cetera. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. And and 30 days is, in my clinical experience, the average amount of, t- of time it takes for the brain to reset reward pathways for dopamine transmission to regenerate itself. There's also a little bit of science that suggests that that's true. Some imaging studies showing that um, our brains are still in a dopamine deficit state two weeks um, after we've been using our drug. And then a, a study by Shuckett and Brown, which took a group of um, depressed men who also were addicted to alcohol alcohol, put them in a hospital where the, they had received no treatment for depression, but they had no, no access to alcohol in that time. And after four weeks, 80% of them no longer met criteria for major depression. So again, this idea that by depriving ourselves of this high dopamine, high reward substance or behavior, we allow our brains to regenerate its own dopamine to, for the balance to really equilibrate. And then we're in a, a place where we can sort of enjoy other things. Mm. You know, that 10 days is going to be miserable. Right. Anxiety, Mm -hmm. trouble sleeping, um, physical agitation to the point where, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, maybe impulsive, angry. Should, Should one expect all of that? Should the family members of people expect all of that? Yeah. So what I say to patients, and it's a really important piece of this intervention, is that you will feel worse before you feel better. Um, For how long? Yeah. This is probably the first question they ask, right? And, And I say, usually in my clinical experience, you'll feel worse for two weeks. But if you can make it through those first two weeks, the sun will start to come out in week three. And by week four, most people are feeling a whole lot better than they were before they stopped using their substance. So, Well, then days 21 through 30, uh, people are feeling better. The sun is starting to come out, as you mentioned, They, it, which translates in the narrative we've created here and supported by biology that dopamine is starting to be released in response to the taste of a really good cup of coffee. For yes, instance. exactly. That, whereas before it was only to insert, you know, addictive behavior. Right. <laughs> is they get sober from whatever. They're doing great. These are people with families. These are people that you discard your normal image of an addict and insert the most normal, typical, whatever, healthy person you can imagine because a lot of these people you wouldn't know were addicts and then all of a sudden you get this call so-and-so's back in jail so-and-so's wife is going to leave him because he drank two bottles of of wine and took a xanax at 7 a.m crashed his truck into a pole it's got two beautiful kids like how did this happen again to the point where by the fourth and fifth time people are just done I mean, maybe people, you might be able to detect the frustration in my voice. I'm dealing with this with somebody that's like, I I don't even know that I want to help this time. It's been so many times to the point where I'm starting to wonder, is this person just an addict? This is just kind of what they do and who they are. And so what I'd like to talk about in this context is what sorts of things help other people that we know that are addicted? What really helps? Not, uh, Not what could help, but what really helps? And are there certain people for whom it's hopeless? I mean, I don't like to hold the conversation that way, but I wouldn't be close to the real life data if, if I didn't ask, is it, is it hopeless? Are there people who just will not be able to quit their substance use or their addictive behavior? Yeah. So there, there are people who will die of their disease of addiction, you know, and I think conceptualizing it as a disease is a helpful frame. There are other frames that we could use, but I do think given the brain physiologic changes that occur with sustained heavy drug use and what we know happens to the brain, it it is really reasonable to think of it as a brain disease. Imagine that you had an itch somewhere on your body, okay? And it was, in, I mean, we've all had that, like, you know, whatever the source. It was super, super itchy. You can go for, uh, you know, if you really focus, you could go for a pretty good amount of time not scratching it. But the moment you stopped focusing on not scratching it, you would scratch it. And maybe you do it while you were asleep, right? That, so, and that is what happens to people with severe addiction. That balance is essentially broken. Homeostasis does not get restored despite sustained abstinence. They're living with 
that constant specter of that pull. It never goes away. So let me say there are lots of people with addiction for whom that does go away. And it goes away at four weeks for many of them. But in severe cases, that's always there and it's lingering. Can we become addicted to sobriety? Right. So this is a great question and it links into some of the other things we've been talking about having to do with where do we settle settle out? You know, what is the way to live between pleasure and pain? And I implied earlier that ultimately we want a resilient balance that's sensitive to pleasure and pain, but that can easily restore homeostasis after we indulge, even when we indulge greatly. People with severe addiction, I believe temperamentally want those extremes and they're wired for that kind of intensity that is more than just these slight adjustments around the fulcrum, right? It's like they want the big highs and the, but the truth is we're all wired for addiction. And if you're not addicted yet, it's it's just, it's right around the corner. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Especially with the incredible panoply of new drugs and behaviors that are out there. You just happen to be addicted to something that is really socially rewarded. You know, you figured that out at an early age. Oh, when I do X, Y, and Z, all these people go, look at that smart kid or whatever it is, you know. Well, you, for me, it made me feel safe. You know, when you think about how hard it is to give up a drug or a behavior that you're addicted to, how much courage that takes and fortitude and discipline and stick to these people are really amazing people. I mean, that's... I, I don't know that I could do it, what they, what they do, you know, it's, and like, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, just the constant ever present urge to use, even after sustained periods of abstinence for some people, that's really, really hard. And of course, then you double down on the shame that, that they feel because of that urge, even when their lives are so much better. I mean, these people are really, really remarkable and you take their remar remarkable accomplishment and then you imagine the world that we live in now where we are constantly invited and tempted and really bombarded with opportunities to become addicted at it's every like you're feeling an itch everywhere. Oh yeah, I mean you yeah. can't escape it. You know, you cannot escape it that you'll get an email in your inbox inviting you to do x y or z and if you're addicted to that thing and you know you tried to like delete all your apps and not go here, all of a sudden your work inbox you're you know you're getting those images, let's say really, really, really hard. And yet these people find a way to do it. I think it's absolutely amazing. And they're really wise people. They have so much wisdom to offer. They've taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, as I talk about in my mm -hmm. book, I have my own addictions and yeah. Uh, you know, you can't go to a meeting uh, or talk to addicts without um, detecting or, or hearing about like lies, shame, et cetera. I heard you say um, in an interview with somebody else recently that truth telling and secrets are sort of at the core of recovery. And um, yeah, tell us more about that. Yeah, so one of the things that I found really fascinating about working with people in recovery was how telling the truth, even about the merest detail of their lives was central to their recovery. And I became really curious about that. Like, why would truth telling be so important? And of course, there is the obvious thing that when people are in their addiction, they're lying about using, you know, so part of getting into recovery is to stop lying to the people they care about, about their use. But it's really more than that, because what, what people in recovery have taught me is that it's not it's not even just not lying about using drugs. I, I have to not lie about anything. I can't lie about why I was late to work this morning, which we all do. Oh, I hit traffic. No, I didn't hit traffic. I wanted to spend two more minutes reading the paper and drinking my coffee, right? Um, or just lying about, you know, I don't know where I had dinner. Like, so people with addiction will get into, you know, the lying habit where they're lying about random stuff because they're sort of in the habit of lying. Why truth telling is important to leading a balanced life. And we know like every religion since the beginning of time is all about telling the truth. Well, why, right? And there's really interesting neuroscience behind it that suggests that when we tell the truth, we actually potentially strengthen our prefrontal cort cortical circuits and their connections to our limbic brain and our reward brain. That, that just that like being open and honest with people really does create very intimate connections. And those intimate connections create dopamine. You know, like having this kind of discussion with you that's very 
intense and also intimate and self-disclosing is very rewarding for me. So that's a, an important source of dopamine. Thank God I became a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. But I am quite transparent with my patients, which is a slightly unorthodox. Um, but you know, when I think it's right, I'm also transparent with them. So that, that's, you know, that's a source of dopamine too, when we're honest and we disclose and that you think people are going to run away from you if you tell them about all like your weird neuroses, but really they don't. What they're like is, oh, thank God, I'm, I'm not the only one, mm -hmm. right? If we look at addiction as a maladaptive thing, something that's making our lives worse or our, our, us less functional at work and in relationships, I could imagine a version of social media where it's making me more connected. I mean, this is a podcast after yes. all. I post yes. videos, this will show up on mm -hmm. YouTube and, mm -hmm. um, and elements of it on Instagram as well. So much like uh, sugar or um, other things, I have to imagine that we need to regulate, not necessarily eliminate this behavior. So I wanna talk about what that looks like. So first of all, social media, um, how addicting is it really? And what is healthy social media behavior? The first message I would wanna get across about social media is that it really is a drug and it's engineered to be a drug. Um, and it's based on, you know, potency, quantity, variety, um, the bottomless bowls, the likes, the way that it's enumerated, all of that, which doesn't mean that we can't use it. Um, but we need to be very thoughtful about the way you, we, we use it, just like we need to be thoughtful about the way we use any drug. Um, and so that means with intention and in advance planning our use, right? And trying to use it in, as a as a as a really awesome tool to potentially connect with other people and not to be used by it um, or get lost in it, and of course you know people are going to come with different propensities for addiction to any drug, and that's true for social media too. Some people will have no problem using it in moderation or using it in a way that's adaptive, and other other people will immediately get, get sucked in. And the key thing about getting addicted is when it's happening, we we nobody who's getting addicted thinks they're getting addicted, right? Let's face it. Right. And if you look at young people today, teenagers, I mean, they're basically cybernetically enhanced that the phone is there. You know, it's like they're talking to you and texting 12 friends at the same time. And there's no stopping it. I mean, the genie mm -hmm. is out of the bottle yeah. where, you know, it's not, we're right. not going back, right. you know? So we, we do need to figure out, you know, how to make this, this tool something that's you know, going to be good for us and, and not ultimately harmful. Narcissistic preoccupation. So there's healthy narcissism, which means that we all invest our personal energies into things that we care about. And if our competence in that arena is threatened, we, we would all experience a narcissistic injury and that's normal and healthy. Um, but, but, but we are living in a narcissistic culture. I mean, that's not news. This preoccupation with individual achievement and individual self-worth and individual self-confidence. And I think all of that is just fueled by social media, where we're not just seeing ourselves, but we're seeing people's reactions to ourselves and every single, you know, thing we say or do, you know, we get likes and this and that. It's really insidious and it contributes, I think, ultimately to a lot of personal shame because we're not really meant to be individuals bouncing around in the universe. We're social animals and we've, we're, we're probably generally happiest even for natural contrarians among us when we're part of a tribe, right? And if we do too much to kind of separate ourselves from, from that tribe, I think that the brain's natural and instinctive corrective mechanism against that is self-loathing and shame. So, you know, it's so ironic because the the culture tells us if we just did. Um, very uh, successful scientist, a member of the National Academy, et cetera, said to me, you know, I just remember it's pinball. You never win. Mm. The best you can do is just keep mm. playing. Yes. And I thought, right. wow, okay, mm -hmm. okay. And mm -hmm. then you just go. Right. But I think that as we achieve more, not just academics, of course, but as anyone achieves more, there's the relishing in the accomplishment. There's often the desire for more, but there's also the pressure of, well, now I have to do this for the next 30 years, mm -hmm. even though I love it. It's the pressure of, right. well, if the mountain is this high, then 
how do I get here and here and right. here? And then you start right. shoveling more dirt on so you can keep right. climbing. And it's a lot of work. Yes. And I think that the um, the perception of success is that there's a roar of the crowd and you cruise. Right. You don't cruise. Mm -hmm. They just give you more to do. Right. Or you give yourself more to do. 